Gilbert, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, it's great to have you here on Next Play, and I'm really excited to chat about some of your most uh, recent short films, your new production company, and uh, the content houses you're working on in, in Houston and in Texas. So we're just a fun interview. Um, cheers. Cheers, man. You got that vanilla milkshake today? Um, I'm excited to have a little bit right now. So I want to dive right into talking about your career because you broke into the media industry in 2016, months after graduating from high school. So you really embody that drive and hunger to create and become an entrepreneur right at the moment of adulthood. Um, take us back to those early days, really, right at the end of high school. What experiences and skills did you already have at that point or you knew you needed to cultivate um, to get started and, and get to where you are now? That's crazy because like when you, when, you, when you ask me that, I'm, I'm just thinking about like five years ago yeah. and it feels like it's been like 10 years, honestly, because yeah. I just can't recognize like... Wow, five years ago, yeah. yeah it's, five, not it's, that, it's not yeah. that long. <laughs> it's, it's not that long, yeah. exactly. Like, so like when you say it, I'm like, oh, it's 2016. Oh, five years yeah. ago. It literally like, like it, it blows me away because I never imagined that I'd be able to like to like even be in places like right now, like yeah. talking about it so soon in, in, yeah. the, in like the journey. Were you making films in high school though? I was making like short films in high school and actually the high school I went to kind of prepared me like like, a, like in many ways for my yeah. trip out to LA. Okay. Even though like I was supposed to go from high school to college, right. I ended up going from high school to LA okay. and then from LA to taking a gap year and then from taking the gap year to not going to college at all. So, yeah. And this was high school in Houston? It was in Houston, yeah. It, it was, um, shout out to Episcopal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, wherever, wherever camera, yeah. Okay. Um, and. It was honestly like a hard decision at the time because I wasn't I wasn't prepared to just kind of go out even just for the summer and be like, yeah. hey, I'm just gonna go and see what what comes from this. Like my my idea was if I'm gonna be in LA one day, um, I might as well try it out now and see if I even like the city because yeah. maybe I like the industry that I'm going into, but maybe I don't like the city. That was like my excuse for coming. If you want to put okay. it that way, fair enough. Yeah, I was like, what else am I gonna do the freshman year before college? Yeah. So I saved up for like three months before going um, going to LA, like towards like the end of my graduation. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, before graduating. And I literally like had like a, I, I would go like to school, I would, then I would go to work for like, I, w I was working like 40 hours a week. What just were you like, doing? I was working at a restaurant. Okay. Yeah, yes. at a restaurant. So this brings a very familiar vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and honestly, like my boss, even at the time was very supportive. He was giving us as many hours as possible. He was like, I was getting off from school at like 10 PM and then going home and doing my three hours of homework. Wow. Like even up to like the finals of like graduation, even though it didn't matter that much, it was still like a thing to go. Yeah. I mean, to, to, to do well in those finals. Right, right. And then from there, um, a week after graduating, I got this cash car and then I was just like, let's just see how it goes. Let's see if this car even makes it too. So you drove out to LA? Yeah, and then I drove out to Austin first. Okay. Um, I met, I met uh, one, of my, one of my family friends and then from there, I drove out to LA. Okay. And upon driving out to LA, that car, that cash car, didn't get an oil check. It didn't get an oil change. Oh no. So on the way there, it broke down like two hours into the trip. I was like driving out at 7 a.m. at 9 a.m. It was just like, gone like the car was like started smoking and then on top of that i got out to like look like check it out in the middle of nowhere this is like johnson texas or something like that johnson city i forgot okay. and it just like i locked myself out of the car <laughs> on top of it not working and i waited there for like two hours until someone came and like and like it was like 9 a.m wow now. and no probably like the journey <laughs> yeah it, it was it was a lot and then from there i like bought a new car on the way finally made it to la and that kind of was like the first like test to like, yeah. are you even gonna make it to LA? But you had to at some point know that you wanted to, like why did you, how did you know you wanted to go to LA and go make films? Well, you think, you know, the thing is that senior year before me graduating, yeah. I got to go to South by Southwest. That's like an MVT okay. because one of my short films made it into South by Southwest and like the high school division of that, okay. of like the competition. And when I went there, I got to meet all these people from like LA, from like San Francisco, from like New York, cause it's yeah. South by Southwest. Right. And upon being there, like I, I got to meet like, like the first lady at the time, Michelle Obama. Uh, and then I got to meet like Queen Latifah, all these like really big celebrities where yeah. I was like, how am I meeting these people? Like, like yeah. just off like leaving, like you could say like the nest. Like I was like, and I was like, I need to like go somewhere else that's not yeah. like comfortable. And that takes me out of like 
just my normal day, right. and I need to do it now. Like it was like, so like it was this. It was basically this 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 festival that kind of changed my perspective because that week after, like it was during spring break. Yeah. That week afterwards, like like the whole school like was like, how was like how was like your your you were present, representing us in Austin? Like how was everything? Yeah. So I just kind of knew like this was like the first time like being anywhere close. Like just people, so many people in the industry. It kind of inspired me to be like, okay, I need to go somewhere where there's like, it's like the mecca of the industry. Yeah. And that's when I came here and, and then I was figuring yeah. it out when I got here. And during that time, you were, what were you doing from a brand perspective? Were you, did you know that you wanted to build a personal brand? Were you on social media or was it just entirely focused on creating the products, which were the films at the time? No, at the time I had like no idea what like social media was to be honest. Really? Like, I came here like, knowing this little about social media only because I would use like the apps as like a, like it's like a spam and I would just post stuff on even oh on even gosh. on like Instagram I would just post like like just like a normal person like every I would post like a picture of like what I'm doing you know what I mean? like people used to do back in the days and stuff like that yeah. but I wouldn't really like consume social media because at the time like I was very like I was working I had like a really like active social life as well yeah. and when I got to LA that's what kind of that's kind of like what I was introduced to. Right. I, I, I got, I was doing like for like photo shoots with people. Like that was my like way of doing it. Like I would like hit up people through like Instagram and be like, hey, do you want to shoot? I'll like give okay. you photos. This was in LA? Or this was already in LA. Okay. I was doing this a little bit in Houston, but it was very different when you do it here. So you did photo shoots here? Yeah, I was doing photo shoots like in exchange for like just getting to shoot them. And then they, and, and that was like a way of networking. Like ah. where you're like, how can I provide value to you? And then, and then, you and how do, how, how do you provide value to me? Even though right. to me it was just like the value was getting to meet someone else because you know, the only place you can meet people at the time was like events and stuff like that. And yeah. this was like five years ago, think about right, that. Right. Now you can just DM people. And I was DMing people back then, but it wasn't as effective as it is now. now. Like yeah. you had to have something. And my thing was like, I'll take photos of you for like an hour and I'll t send you 10 back. And now you have photos for your, for your feed and stuff like that. And how did it go? So you were in LA, what was, so you were doing these photo shoots. What happened next? Like, what was the progression so, of getting you eventually? Because you went to you went to Mexico at some point, and I feel like that's when you yeah. built your really strong brand presence. Yeah. So like, what what happened in LA before you got there? So eventually, I started coming across this group of like like models that eventually, because I would have to hit up models would be the most interested, like people that would be the most interested in like right. that type of value, and then from there they would all be friends with everyone else. Like like again, for me it was just about meeting people, and all of a sudden all these yeah. everyone. Else, these people, everyone else, were all like the old viners and like like okay. the creators of the time that were like now trans transferring all their like converting all their following to like Instagram and like YouTube. Ooh. So when I got involved with those people, that just opened like a whole different. Were you door. on Vine? Um, I was on Vine for a little bit, but I think I deleted all of it like okay. at some point. Like I think in my junior, no, my sophomore year, I was on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. And so then, what, what was the big pull then to get you to go to Mexico? Because you did that. Mm. When was that? What year was that? That was like literally like eight, no, like ten months after that. So, yeah. so I got involved with um, with the first like creator house on the internet ever, like during that summer. Yeah. And I became like a producer and everything. This was like the first house ever that like made it on the internet. It was called yeah. Team Ten. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Yeah, Team Ten. And they're like the OGs basically of like content houses that were like made it like a thing. Okay. You, you know? Yeah. So once I got involved with them for like eight months, like, no, sorry, six months, um, that kind of like opened like a whole different world because I was literally living that day to day with yeah. all these talents that were they, where they had no blueprint what social media was. And basically, we were creating the blueprint of what it was going to become, yeah. which was, which is what happened like two years ago when all these like, TikTok houses and et cetera right. started becoming together. It was based off of like what's happened in the last few years, you know? Yeah. But, at the, but at the time it was just like, let's just try it out and see how it goes. Nothing was legitimized. It was just mm -hmm. like, even the articles that were coming out, it was like, they're trying this. Like it wasn't like yeah. they're doing this. It was like, they're gonna try to do this. And they, and it's like, it's like a new thing. It's like a new invention. Like it, was, it wasn't treated like a, like a business. Yeah. And obviously now it's a business, a billion, like, like it's, it's a it's really big business. Yeah. But at the time it was just like, Let's just build a, a house, a house creators. And, and creators and, and also um, for me, it was just like, let, let me see how I can, how, how I, how I add value here, yeah. you know, aside from like working for them, but it was like, how do I add value here? Yeah. And upon being in that, in that, in that, in the house, um, as a producer, I got, I came across, um, a really big Mexican influencer mm -hmm. 
who basically opened the door for me to go into the Latin American market. Okay. And then when I went into the Latin American market, when I went to Mexico City, basically, yeah. I realized that this is something that I needed to go for. And I met some kids there that were like, hey, you should like, you should, you should come like help us out and just see how, see how it goes. Yeah. And That's then, awesome. yeah. So while you were living in Mexico City though, you, you gained a lot of local and online fame by joining yeah. the YouTube channel Dos Ogas, yeah. right? And you guys actually reached over a billion views. Yeah. Like you, were, you were essentially a co-founder of the first ever Latin American content creator house, right? Yeah. So tell us a little more about what you all did at Dos Ogas and, and how that leveled the playing field really for the next generation of Latinx content creators. Yeah, it's crazy. So for at the time, it was just like, all right guys, like it, we're living in, like, in an apartment yeah. and we we're like, let's just post daily vlogs on YouTube. It, it, it wasn't even like, let's create content like a content house. It yeah. was like, let's just make a team. Let's make it a team. Like let's become like a group of, a group of people that that will post on YouTube every single day and just see how it goes. Yeah. Because at the time, posting daily on YouTube wasn't really a thing, like, like in the Latin American market. It was, it was more like a US thing. It was a whole different demographic of like 500 million people that you could reach and just stop doing that. You know? wow. Probably at the time, 300 million because there was like a lot less cell phones than there is now, yeah. like five years yeah, ago, six, yeah. four years ago, sorry. So basically, the guys already had like, like a following like from like that they had built in like four years. Okay. It was like it was like close to like a million. From social media from, content creation or from YouTube. YouTube. YouTube okay. Yeah. And basically when I came in the picture and to, and other people came in the picture to like just create this kind of like like new format yeah. for which is daily vlogging, we were we were like, okay, how are we gonna do this like in our own way, but also like here in Mexico and like yeah. garnering Mexican following. Because they were coming from Argentina. So for right. them, it was it, this was a new thing. It was like raining in like this, like Mexico being like the top market, yeah. one of the top markets in Latin America. It was like if we rain here, we rain all over Latin America. You know, like right. so. So we we just started posting daily, and I came in, kind of just helped them like like put it on, and, and yeah. basically co-found this project. Yeah. I can't take all the credit because creativity wise, they they are sure. they they put on that that side as much as possible. But once once we after like. 15 days, which is 15 videos yeah. of literally, if we had we, if we had missed a day of posting, mm -hmm. I don't know what would have happened because it was the cons the consistency of like going from day one to day 15, where like every single video was so important, even if one video didn't do well, to get into that 15 video that like blew up, and then wow. after that 15 video, we continued to post daily, and then they all started blowing up in like two weeks. In two weeks, like. I was going into this probably with like a following on Instagram of like a hundred thousand people, from like my photography, and in two weeks I went up to like four hundred thousand. Wow, you know I mean? just that's insane. just off of this like YouTube project, and on YouTube we went like from like we we, we gained like I think like over one point two million people in like yeah. thirty days, and then most of that was in the last two weeks of that first month. What did what did that mean to you though, as like an artist and an entrepreneur, yeah. in terms of breaking through these barriers and stereotypes yeah. about how media should be produced in Mexico or Latin America? Honestly, like, I always thought like very deep of it. I was like, yeah. like, do I really want to like turn into this creator, yeah. creator stuff? Like this at this time, we didn't even call it creator. We call it right. influencer. The creator term is a very new term that is kind of being re redefined, yeah. you know, because now it's like a whole different like just like when people say like you're like a like when, pe like when people say content, like content it was a whole different definition yeah. two or three years ago than what it is now. Now right. it's like anything that you consume, even if it's an Instagram story, where like before it was like certain types of content, you yeah. know, like there's media, there's, there's a films, there's music, like all types. Now it's like just anything you consume. Yeah. So with, with the time, like we, honestly to me it was like, it was a lot deeper than that. It was like, what am I gonna accomplish that is going to, make me justify me not going back to, me not starting college. Oh, like, that was wow. my thing. <laughs> that was the mindset, really. I mean, it's kind of like a survival instinct, right? Yeah. It's like, how do I, I know I don't want to go to this. And a lot of entrepreneurs are that way, right? They know, they, they don't know exactly what they want to build or what they want to do, but they know that they don't want to go to college. And so, or do their nine to five or whatever. Right, yeah, that's so, interesting. Okay. Honestly, that's how deep it was. For me, it was like, okay, I got a gap year. I've learned so much this last year, but I don't have so, like this thing still. Yeah. And this was like the peg that, that, that it took. I was like, wait. And I had just gotten my first campaign to like on social media. So like literally like. What do you mean by campaign? Like my first paid social media campaign that like came to me. They're like, hey, pay to post us. Oh wow. Okay. Like it was like a dating app. Yeah. 
That's hilarious. Okay. But it was literally like a so picture. So that was like your first influencer type gig. That, right? Yeah, that was like my first influencer type gig. Like it was me like just holding my phone and like talking about like this app. That's yeah. it in the caption and tagging it in the, in the picture. Like that's all it was. And it was like a few thousand dollars at the time. It was like, wait, I could make that's something awesome, off man. of this. Like and in Latin America as well, it was like, oh, interesting. Because obviously when you go into like other markets that are not the US market, right. um, the, the, the pay is a lot different in terms of like how the market moves economy wise, especially yeah. with the influencer, um, with the influencer like industry where it's a whole different marketing yeah. like world than it is here. So as a, as a filmmaker though, did you ever feel, or even now, do you ever feel like because you didn't go to school to become a filmmaker that you're not like accepted within the community or there's this like stigma towards you? You know, at the beginning I did feel that way, okay. but as I started like just getting to know more people, because yeah. I eventually came back to LA, I realized that there's like the, the like Christopher Nolans, and then there's like the like Martin Scorsese's, you know? Okay. And I, I, I think, <laughs> if I'm not getting it right, I think Nolan didn't do college, and then, yeah, and then Scorsese did, yeah. And it's all about your work at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, you're gonna Your work speaks for itself. Yeah, you're gonna have to break like yeah. the, that stigma whenever you talk to people and be like, hey, like, like I didn't go to film school, but then you, at the end of the day, whether you went to film school or not, yes, in film school for some people it will work like in terms of having that structure and that infrastructure, right. but for others, they don't need it maybe, you know? Yeah. It's all about their work at the end of the day. And, and then eventually they build it, because you have to build it anyways, but at the end of the day, it's like you can put side to side like the, the kid who went to film school and the kid who's been doing film for five years, and it's all also based on the audience, who the audience like yeah. who, who, who you're showing this to. So for me, it was just about finding the tribe of people that are accepting of that yeah. and are supporting of that. Because at the end of the day, again, whether, whether you didn't go and didn't go, that's what you're gonna have to do. Fair enough. Yeah. So you, you talk a lot about your experiences as a, as a Mexican American, as a Latino artist, yeah. um, and as a part of a larger lar uh, Latinx creative and entrepreneurial community. And there is a growing demand for Latinx across all media forms. Um, and yeah. incredibly talented Latinx artists are stepping up and, and filling that demand. What role do you think Latin American content creators really have on this American and, and global markets? Honestly, um, right now, I think it's, it's, still, it's still very, to me at least, it's still very shocking yeah. because, again, when I look back, like when I started just getting into all this, yeah. it wasn't really a thing at all. It, like the closest thing you had to it was when, when JB jumped on Despacito. Like wow. that was what yeah. really like, just like it opened that that world where people were like, oh wow, yeah, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Okay. I, I think a, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're like <laughs> in the same Western hemisphere, hemisphere of the world, yeah. and and social media kind of opened, like made it available. Made it available to everybody. Yeah. And because if you think of it before, it wasn't really like that. It was just like what we consume from like. TV and from the radio, yeah. but you didn't really get you didn't really get to pick where where, where you wanted to to listen to your, to your content from. Right. Where when you think about how many how many Mex how many Mexican Americans how many La how many Latin ex people live in like in, in the U S. All the Latinos are here. Yeah. It's like it's tens of millions of them, right. and a lot of them are all looking to connect with their roots as well because they want to figure out the other side of them that maybe they didn't get to know because they came here, they immigrated here and they just yeah. got, a, got like accustomed to, to, to the culture here. How do you toe that line, line then though? Because yeah. you're both, right? You grew up here and yeah. you have this side of you that you're Hispanic, you, you know, from Mexico and you've gone and created content there. How do you decide what you want to do? Whether you yeah. want to make content in Spanish or you want to make it in English or you want to make it for your US following or you want to make it for um, your Latin following? Like how do, you, yeah. how, do you, how do you balance that? How do you reconcile those two things? So honestly, that, that's been a really hard like, like line to cross, like to like, to, like figure out yeah. till this day, to, to be completely yeah. clear with you. Because when I did this Mexican project, like this well, Latin American project in Dos Sogas in, in, in Latin America, it was so big that like we, we had like, we had like a tour where like one of, we had two sold out nights where like it was like 2,000, 4,000 people. You know what I mean? It was, uh, it was people that were paying to come see us like, like 50 bucks, like a, a, a ticket just to like wow. see us in person and then meet and greet like a hundred bucks, whatever, you know what I mean? In Latin America, which is a whole different yeah. dynamic. What were you doing? Were you like performing for them? Yeah, so we had songs, we had like, it, it was like, a, it's kind of like a trivia show if you want to put that. And it was like the okay. vlog in real life. All right, fair So enough. we'd make up like scenarios and people, people really just wanted to like see you be all. in our world for a little yeah. bit because we'd also be vlogging there. 
Okay. So then they would be able to like have that video like for the rest of their life. Right, right. It's kind of like, till this day it happens where, where like, because we st stop posting eventually, it kind of feels like we're like child stars in a way. You know, okay. like people, people will be commenting on us. They're like, oh my God, I haven't seen you in like three years. Wow, oh, you were, you were, wow, you were my, you were my childhood. Because now they're like, some of them were like 15, 16 at the time, and yeah. now they're like 18, 19, they're adults, and it's a whole different world of responsibilities. Yeah. So the line is really hard, like, like it's still like, like a hard like, to, to like maneuver because yeah. it's, it's, that it just exploded so big that like, I can't ignore those people also because they've gotten me to where I am today, even if it's in a different, world, different country now, yeah. it's still like helped me in terms of like having that notoriety, especially now because it's so connected as well that basically like I do a little bit of both, like specifically with the, the projects that I've been working on recently, where, where I just keep it bilingual. You know, I, I try to cater as much as possible to the, um, the US Latin, even though the US Latin has become more like, more, more, like bi, more like bilingual and they're more in touch with like their roots and like, yeah. being, or just coming like more to terms with like the culture of like their Latin American roots. And then the, the the Latam like content that, that would be more towards them, like even the comedy, honestly, it's yeah. so different that I just basically also as a creator have, li have stepped back a bit and I more than anything come together, come, come, come with a group of people right. and kind of like figure it out with them, you know, knowing all this knowledge where like, because I know so much, I feel like that's where I have that, 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 that like inconsistency where like where I want go to go with, yeah. with it because the passion gets in the way. But yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, and it makes yeah. sense. But the I, I guess so. You bring these people together. Yeah. They're also all from different backgrounds, though, right? Yeah. You work with Argentinians and Colombians and yeah. literally anyone from Latin America. How do you reconcile that again, right? Because it's even it's another layer on top of it, right? It's like okay, yeah. yes, we're going to cater to a Latin market, but even within the Latin market, there are several <laughs> different languages and and cultures and comedies. So like, yeah. how do you? How does it work? <laughs> so, so, so something that, for, for the, at least for the products I've been doing now, we've been very focused on mostly the U.S. like land market. Okay. So, Sounds and, and then on our, on like when we come together and create content, but like for their personal pages, like they usually cater like to Latin, so like, so like the Latin market, Latin American market. Okay. To, so like when we come together, we, we, we're like have like our, like our, our, like our group page mm -hmm. and, and we do like things that we just know are relatable because we grew up in the U.S. at the end of the day. So, and we're familiar with the U.S., um, with the U.S. culture and everything. So also the fact that, another thing that brings us together is the fact that we're all bilingual. Right. So, so I, it's just like these little things like that, that like it may sound a little complex, but when we come together, we're like, wow, it's like a whole different like freedom. It works. It works. It, yeah. it took a bit to figure it out, but it worked, yeah. yeah. And so, do you still recommend that people do that? Like, would you tell young Latinx artists and, and creators to go and, and collaborate with literally anyone in that sphere and to really try to capture this Latin market or, or something else? I would say, at the end of the day, it's, more, it's all more based on what you want. Yeah. Because even in the project that I'm working on right now, which is Teja's house, um, right. the, we have an artist in there that, that she is mostly focused on like hip hop and et cetera. Okay. And, and that is like a like not, like in English, you know, and that's like not very resonating with like the Latin American market. Yeah, pop, but hip hop is like very different. Yeah. So, so it all goes back to like, you. There is ways to still like, we have to be diversified in general as a creator, as an entrepreneur, as a yeah. anything nowadays. So it's just a matter of like, do I have any passion in this? Like even when you collaborate with someone, like is it just because? If, am I just going to collaborate because? They have numbers or because someone told me to yeah. or it's because it makes sense as well like what are we connecting because guess what the, pe the person on the other side usually will be able to tell if yeah. there's a certain chemistry there or they'll be able to tell if there's no chemistry there and it's just something where people are just doing it for like the cloud you know yeah so i feel like for any upcoming people it's more about building your community yep uh, and and just having that support system because you're gonna need it. You, it it's all a team effort with anything in, in entertainment or just anything that you're doing. Like even if you're doing a study group, yeah. just you want to build like a like a group of people that are going to understand you. Yeah. And and if they're all Latinos like you, whatever, like yeah. then it helps you a little bit because then you kind of grew up similarly. So you're like not having to cross that bridge of like 
how do, how do you grow up or trying to understand your world yeah. and you understand my world. So as being a, I mean, now you're an influencer, right? You have a very large following, I think, on social media and, you know. But you, I don't feel like it. I, you might not feel like it, but it, it is. And <laughs> yeah. so, you know, having that level of reach, it comes with some level of responsibility. And so mm -hmm. I'm curious, like having this identity of being Mexican-American mm -hmm. and creating all this content for both, both audiences, is there ever like a sense of responsibility that comes with that of like, I need to speak for my, my, my Latin crowd and I need to speak to, by doing, taking that perspective and speaking to my American crowd or vice versa. Um, Absolutely. Do, is that ever a challenge for you? It, it is a challenge because a lot of the time. Or is there a lot of expectation? Is there a lot of expectation from one audience or the other that you should be talking more about things or be, you know, be a spokesperson in a way for, for people? I've, I've felt it before in terms of like the expectation and in those times I did like speak on about it yeah. but the, the thing that happens right now is, is like sometimes like there's issues that are very like valid to like Latin America that yeah. I, like it would be like oh I need to post about this but then it's completely relevant to here mm. and vice versa. Okay. So like on my end like I just try to make sure that like even if I'm not even if I'm not like the one that's being a spokesperson about it, I'm yeah. pushing other people that I know also have a platform to push on to like, cause like honestly, I even forget to post on social media nowadays. Really? Yeah, like it's so hard to believe. It's hard to believe. But I like, like it's very key moments where I'm like, okay, I need to, I need to, I need to like get this content piece or something for my yeah. stories. But otherwise I'll go days without posting on like just, I could go weeks without posting because there's so much going on now behind the scenes where I'm helping other people. Yeah. And with this responsibility. You're busy building. Yeah, especially with the responsibility of having a following. Yeah. And when you have like different audiences as well, where it's honestly like, like I just try to do as much as I can. Yeah. And if it's not on my social media, it's off social media. Right. Because that's one thing that I feel a lot of people forget that just because you're not doing something on social media about it, or sharing this post or whatever. You're still living your life. That, <laughs> living, living your life, things. but also you could be doing a whole different thing right. behind the scenes. So because at the end of the day, it's also one of those things where like three years ago, I had no idea. Yeah. Sorry, four years ago, I had no idea that it was gonna become what it's gonna become. For me, it was just like, hey, let me just build a following so I could just not go to college and have something to justify it. Yeah. And let me be in these YouTube videos and be a character in them. Hmm. I didn't know that all these things were gonna come and it like the responsibility things happen where like I can't say certain things, I can't I can't share certain things just because right. you wanna keep it like that's your person that, that's like your brand. You wanna keep people happy, yeah. It's almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You wanna keep it happy, like you can't post when you're sad. You know, I can't like at least yeah, I don't, don't Yeah, because because you don't I mean, you can post. But people it doesn't I mean for one it doesn't convert. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And and yeah, people don't I mean in general you, no one will like most people don't like going on social media to feel sad. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I'm not saying you can't, obviously you can't. Like I have shared moments before like where I've gone through like a breakdown or something, like it's happened yeah. before, but it doesn't make people feel good. And yeah. my goal at the end of the day is to share content that makes people feel good yeah. or that at least distracts them from their day to day because that's what they're there to do. They're there to get distracted. Yeah, and, and I, had, I had Casey on the show a while back and yeah. he, I asked him the same question that I'm about to ask you, which is, uh, I get it, and I do the same thing. I, I also try to keep my entire, I, I mean, in general, I feel like I'm a very optimistic person, and very positive, and so that's what I want to portray on my social media. Mm -hmm. But the other question that always remains in my mind is, does that actually create a barrier to where it's, mm -hmm. I feel I'm almost unreachable to people because it's like, I can't relate to this person. He's always having a great day. It's always an amazing day in the land of Gilbert or whoever. Why, why would I follow this person? He's mm -hmm. like, I can't relate. My day sucks or I'm unhappy or whatever. So there's one mindset that's like, okay, you get a break from your life and that's what social media is. Like you said, it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. But the other is when you're an influencer and you're a vlogger, if you don't show that side of the, you know, the hardships of regular life, you become unrelatable. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that or any experience with this? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to me, it's just like, as much as I can try to be relatable, yeah. I feel like my day to day is not relatable. Fair enough. <laughs> because I literally, like right now, like, yeah. Like I've, I've gotten to like the opportunity to like live with like eight people that are right. all content creators. Like that's yeah. not relatable. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> you know, the, the closest thing to relatable is like a sorority or something like that. Mm -hmm. But even if I was to share that, it's more like just kind of like showing like entertainment at the end of the day. Yeah. So as for, for, for the type of person that I am, as, as relatable as I, type, as I, as I try to be, yeah. like even this whole journey with like going to LA and all these things, yeah. 
It's not relatable to like, like, most, it, like yeah. to most people. It's not, and it's yeah. more like, why are you telling us these things? At least how I see it. Like, I, I pick and choose the moments where it's like relatable when it has to do with family and stuff like that, and I do share those. Yeah. But otherwise, I feel like with the path that I got into, it, yeah. it, it has it's very hard to be relatable to anybody because Fair enough. of the early start. <laughs> What about hate though, right? So being oh. so present on social media, how do yeah. you how do you deal with hate that you receive? Are there any like is there like a, a story that really, you know, you remember and resonates and it's still in the back of your head? Absolutely. Yeah, so I had like you could say like a moment on social media back in 2018 mm -hmm. and it was really bad. Like it was like millions of views on YouTube and everything. It was like a back and forth sort of thing, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's, it was a what? Sorry, a back it was like and a forth? back and forth, like it was like m like me versus them sort of thing. You know what I mean? Oh, I see. And and it was actually with um with with a team member from one of the from one of that from Dos Ogas. Okay. Um, we're all good now, but it was it was like a it was like a moment where like, basically, unfortunately, it, it pinned it pinned our fan bases with each other in a way. Oh. And and that wasn't good because like people were not people were like, I, I want to be on both teams because I love like. The, the whole thing, like it's not about you or them. Yeah. But during this time, like I was getting like death threats and like like all these oh, like, wow. like it wasn't like a little bit, like yeah. it's still kind of there. How like, old were you at this time? I was 21, I was okay. 21, so yeah, it was, it feels like a long time ago now, but that yeah. moment, like at the time it was like, I was very numb because it was so much incoming. Right. And I was reading it, which is the worst thing. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's okay, I'm gonna get over it. It did affect me a little bit because of what people were thinking, Yeah. but, it wasn't like, I would just close my phone and be like, okay, I, I'm not gonna think about that. Mm. But eventually, after that moment, like it was very hot for the moment and then a few weeks went by, it continued. A few months went by, it continued. Like you just see those comments, you just see like, yeah. like that energy. How long did it go on for? It, it probably went on for around uh, um, four months, five months. Okay. But uh, by, by the third month, I went full into like just like, uh, I had like the lowest moment probably of my life ever, you wow. know, because of social media. Yeah, and, but and I think it's, I mean, it's, it's a good thing to talk about because a lot of people I think are affected by their social media, right? Yeah. They get like Especially really now. dark places um, because of yeah. it. So how did, how did you deal with it? Uh, it's going to sound really cliche, Yeah. but I started like working out. Okay. I started like, <laughs> I started um, eating better too. Yeah. And I, I also like came back to LA like full time. I, I, I left the environment that kind of reminded me of that, which in essence at the time it was, it was the country, the city, because yeah. I knew they were like miles away from me. It was like a thing. Okay. And it was, it was people there, like when people like came up to me in the streets um, because that would happen. I was like, are they really a fan or is it someone that like probably was hating on my page like two days ago and then now they're asking uh, for a picture. Because that would happen too. Like when people yeah. like, people were like, damn, like at first, like I used to like not like you, but then I met you in person and and you're so nice. Like I, I, I thought you were like the character on the YouTube videos. So it was like all these things were like when I came here because that, at the time that falling was just there, right. like I was like you're away from it. it. Yeah. I was away from it. It's so like, it was like leaving the environment as well. Yeah. And also just building like a really solid group of friends that were emotionally supportive, like to my situation at the time. Yeah. And, and honestly, like, I don't know how I got like, like, like I did that for a few months, but I don't know how, like it, it hit me so fast, like where I, I had no idea like it was coming. Like yeah. it was just all of a sudden, whoa. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Mexico City though, because you have a yeah. big love for Mexico uh, yeah. and Mexico City specifically. Yeah. Um, and I think it's amazing. So you lived there and you were supporting uh, Zorita's artistic yes. vision, right? Yes. And, and later producing your and directing your own short film. Yeah. Uh, La Sangrienta Navidad. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I feel like a lot of Americans think of vacation spots like Tulum when they <laughs> think of Mexico or about like, you know, the beautiful wilderness closer to Texas. But, yeah. uh, you know, Mexico City is a fantastic metropolis yeah. and, and it's a very complex city full of high energy and, yeah. and great art. I want you to, you know, transport this audience there. Like, yeah. tell me why you love Mexico City so much specifically. Absolutely, man. When I was introduced to the Mexican market because of Juan Pazurita, Okay. Um, then I was invited out by the Dos Horas guys, which was two of them at the time. I had no idea what was coming to me. Like, like I just knew like I was touching, like I, I was just touching, going into like my roots. Yeah. But I had no idea that there was like this whole other world in a city of nearly 22 million people. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> which is crazy. crazy. 
because you think of all the culture that goes on in that city and, yeah. and you're coming from a city like at the time you're coming from a city like LA which is like 7 million people or something like that or something right. like that I forgot and I had just no idea so basically like I get on the plane I get to Mexico and I'm like whoa there's like buildings here they're like really nice oh wow like, so even you <laughs> right you had this mindset even yeah. being Hispanic that's yeah crazy. exactly I was like wait like there's like there's like store there's like a Walmart here or what like there's like all these things <laughs> you're like, shocked by yeah. the infrastructure and then I'm like wait like that's crazy like, j- even just arriving to like my friend's apartments there yeah. uh, apartment there and I'm like oh wow like there's like a like a pizza spot there and it was like normal it wasn't like a vacation yeah. touristy spot it's like a city you know and then I was like damn it's like damn it's like so green here and it's like so like lit it felt like New York honestly because I had been to New York already it felt like a New York where it was everything was like it was like a concrete jungle yeah. but the Mexican version of it to me okay where it honestly like when like walking down the streets like you, you hear like the people like where like the street vendors and you hear like the just like the energy the, the motorcycles the cars like beeping yeah. and and just it is an insane amount of energy where like the days over there weekdays like it's like from like 6 a.m. It's like yeah. 10 p.m. It's crazy. And then weekends, it's quiet. Because wow. it's not like here where like weekends, yeah, people go out over there, but usually the weekends in like Mexico City at least, people use it to like recharge and just hang out at home. Okay. And then the young people will go out and party and club, right, you know. Right, but right. but in general, honestly, it's just the food too. Like you go to places and you're like, there's like taco spots in like every other corner of like Mexico City. Yeah. Tacos de Pastor. And all these really cool places are also like so like like coming from like at the time coming from like LA it was like so cheap and I was like, yeah. wow, this is crazy. And, and as a filmmaker, that was really important to you too, yeah. right? Because you're like, okay, I can come here and I can make films a lot cheaper, right? That that not cheaper for sure. I'll tell you that, but you get more for what you put up, put in if you want to put it that sure. way. Because it's still like the film industry in general. It's a very expensive industry anywhere, right. especially as, like it's getting better now because the it's gear so is more accessible. Easier, yeah. But, but even like the labor, you know, like yeah. even re- the really good people in Mexico, because they're really good in Mexico, they're usually used to getting hired out by like US, like US companies in Mexico to shoot US, like stuff that shoots in Mexico for the US and stuff like that. Okay. So it's still like very like, it's not, it's not as cost prohibitive as here, but it still can be. Yeah. Because, because even in, if, you're, if, you're, if you're someone that's growing up in the Mexican society and you're trying to go into film, yeah. it's like, it's very hard to even get to that level of like breaking through all these barriers where the art is not valued in an in, in an economy that doesn't yeah. basically like put art as one of one as one tell of. Tell me its about that a little bit. Lives. What is the youth art scene like in Mexico City yeah. compared to like Houston or LA? It's very indie. It's, it's very like indie. it's like they're like they're heavily inspired by like like a lot of European and also a lot of like Me- a lot of like like the U.S. But also like it's like its own version in Mexico. It's like. People come like like everything kind of like has like a root even there because yeah. because of like the history of Mexico and etc. But w- what you find in Mexico City, you're gonna find something completely different in like Monterey or like Cancun, like yeah. and like Tulum is like a whole other like situation. Right, that's right. A, it's a more touristy. Yeah. Know? But as far as like the art industry there, I will tell you this: they consume a lot of social media and a lot of like creators, which is what helped us at the time. Yeah. That because we were the first people that were vlogging daily, the Mexican algorithm, the Latin American algorithm was pushing us to like all these people. So as far as like art form wise, um, I haven't, I don't have the best knowledge of it, but I do know like from my close friends that there is a huge like, like it's, it's, it's very like indie, like everybody has like their own thing going on. It's very like passion driven as well because Mexican people are very passionate yeah. and it shows in their art form where like, it's literally about the, the creation versus like, you know, how what we're used to here, we're like, okay, what's gonna be our ROI for this? You know? <laughs> Fair enough. What about, so I, I wanna talk about your, the film. Um, so La Sangrieta Navidad, you mm. released that and, and First Timers, mm. both short films online right around Christmas 2019. Mm. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that experience? Like what, what did 2020 mean for your film career? Yeah. So. Those were like my first films that were ever like budgeted, yeah. like, like in general. Like I had, I had always like wanted people to like come and like help, like be a part of the film. Yeah. These were like the first films that were budgeted, um, where I was able to hire like a crew and all these things and hire actors and pay them. Yeah. And last time, then I, the first timers was like, like 
kind of like a test run, if you want to put it that way, where it was like all shot in one location and okay. in like one room. And it's crazy because I, I, I go look at it on YouTube and I'm like, oh my God, how, how did this get, how, how, how did this get pushed to that many people? Like, yeah. cause on YouTube it has like, I think like 10 million people, 11 million people. Wow. I have no idea because I don't keep track of it anymore. I'm like, please don't show it anymore because it's been like so long. You I don't like even it? talk about it. No, I do, but it's something, as an artist, I get it. You Your look old at, work sometimes. Yeah, is, exactly. You're like, yeah. it's not a representation of me anymore. But I'm very proud of it because I'm like, I think of that day and how that day yeah, went. Yeah, everyone and starts like, from somewhere. That's, exactly. And, and it's and good quality. I thought it was, I think it's great content. Yeah. Like, I've seen them. I think they're great. Thank you so much. Yeah, I've, I didn't hear it too. It's just the artist part yeah. of me is like, has like his own opinions of it, you know, because yeah. you think of the editing and all that stuff. But after all that time being in Mexico City and in LA doing your thing, you decided to base Sosa Projects mm. out of, which is your new media company, yeah. out of Houston. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the decision to bring it back to Houston? Yeah, so so all these things in the last few years, like the films yeah. and all that, it kind of like gave me, especially with the digital globalization that's happening now, where it's like, it gave me just this tick that I was like, man, like I really love this, this traveling thing, the back and forth, but I want to do just something different and I want to do it now. And I don't wait till later where like I don't have, where I, I will have a lot more to lose. Yeah. So I, I came back to this like realization that um, especially after what happened in 2020, you know, right. it was a very, very hard year. Yeah, with the COVID. Exactly. I was like, let me just move back to Texas for now, and let me just be yeah. with family at least. If I'm not, if I'm not gonna see um, the the whole world yeah, and yeah. work like like I did before and travel like I did before. Right. And when I was there in Texas, I realized that everything I wanted to do, like there was these pause periods, and the pause periods were longer than like the actual working periods. Oh, and, and, and for those pause periods, I was like, is it, does it really make sense for me to be in like Mexico or LA or would I just want to travel there? Because yeah. you think of like, just even when you're here, like when you're living here in LA, like if your friend doesn't live within five miles from you, you barely see them. You see them like a yeah. few weeks, like every few weeks, you know? Fair enough. Because they're like on the other side of LA. Yeah, yeah. Unless they it's, drive it's to you. It's not ideal, yeah. Because you're so focused on your goal right. that you just want to like, like you're interacting with some people, you're seeing other people more consistently than them. Yeah. So I was like, what if I just did like my thing out here in Houston? Because also I've, it's, it's been booming like crazy with like the, even the Latin, like the Latin market mm -hmm. where, where it's the fourth largest city in, in, in the country. But when you think of Latin, you think of like LA and Miami, you know, you don't yeah. really think of Houston, even though Houston has like the biggest. I think biggest of Texas, but I agree. I think, I think yeah. Houston and Austin, like I less. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You think of all these other things, but, but Houston literally has like the biggest Mexican population, like in like, yeah. from what, from what I heard from like all the other cities, you know, which is, it makes sense because you're right near the, like the border too and all these things, right. you know, and people, people are coming to from Mexico. Like, like, like my, I have friends who are like, who have moved from Mexico city yeah. to Houston because wow. they're like, they're like, it's cool there right now. And I was like, I grew up there. Let me just go back there. Yeah. So, so the products basically, honestly, like I'm not even sure if I could say it's a media company it, right now. It functions that way. Okay. But my goal is to do a lot more than that with like, like going to like the restaurant business and going to like, okay. like, like, a, like the, the touring, like all these other little things that, that are like come from it. Yeah. But right now it's, it's, it's more in that you could say in that, in like that world of like media, because it's all about social media right now, everything that I'm doing. Yeah. Tell me about that yeah. though. So you, 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 you and I personally have spoken about this restaurant idea a yeah. couple of times. I think it's really great because I, it speaks to the role that I think you're personally able to play in the, the Latinx story of Houston. Mm -hmm. um, so what is, what, what's the dream with the restaurants? The dream, honestly, it's like right now, um, not the concept, but the dream is like to build like kind of like a chain of like restaurants that kind of resemble like the experiences that I've had with food. Right. Like in the like, just my my whole life. Yeah. So like, a lot of that is probably gonna be Mexican. Yeah. But also as a Texan, because I, I, at the end of the day, I'm also a Texan. Yeah. So so right now, like the dream is just to kind of like start off like going that direction, whether it's like doing like something as simple as like a pop up or or like a food truck or something right. just cool that also is gonna be great for social media. Because obviously right now the social media thing is something you could utilize like yeah. do marketing around that. 
but also doing it at like at home where I can literally have like my teachers and like my 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 colleagues who like I went to high school with and all these people be like yo come come get some food like it's on me you know yeah. I don't know it's just and the reason I love this though is I yeah. mean the show is called next play and it's about you know what people are going to be working on and what yeah. their dreams are and and and, and you know, never dwelling on what's happened or even if it's a win and not over celebrating, but focusing on the future and what you want to Absolutely. build. And what I love about this restaurant, when you first pitched it to me and it's the ideas is that you wanted to bring, you know, all the people and that you've grown up with and whoever else and one, give them jobs and help them come yeah. and work in this. But also because you said food is so central to the culture, right? And so yeah. central to um, how we communicate. And I, I agree, I, I'm a big foodie as well. <laughs> I, I love food, man. Like, yeah. I, for a moment, I love food a little too much that like, I, 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 when I was doing this project in Mexico, I like gained like 25 pounds. Oh Nothing wrong gosh. with that. But <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was just, I would not stop eating. You know, I had no like, I was like, yeah. Gilbert, you can eat tomorrow, it's okay. You know, just don't go over, don't go over your limit for today. You'll be, you'll be okay tomorrow. Yeah. And I'm like, Wow, like I, I don't know, like you just even hear me talk about it, right? I get it. So how much I love food. So like, it's like that's like another thing in there, and I feel like again, like even with like when you're doing something in the food industry, depending on what it is, it's very important to know how to market it. You know, so yeah. even coming from social media, I feel like right now, this is all like ideas, and obviously like they haven't been put into action, but that's that's yes. still gonna be the next place. You know, that's that's, that's like 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 those things are like what's coming next, aside from like. This whole other thing with like social media that, I don't, yeah. that, that I'm gonna keep developing, but these are like the, you could say the like the milestones that are becoming yeah. as well. What about so right now you're currently working on content houses, mm -hmm. right? Uh, at Teas House and there's there Compa House. As Compa well. House. Yeah. Can you tell me about them? Yeah. So these ha content houses basically is like a, when a group of creators come together, and some of them are bigger than the others. And and these are both out of Houston. This time, these are right? both. Yeah. These are both in Texas. Okay. And. And basically, they come together and not 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 like both houses, but like it with like with each house, like Taz House, people people come together and they create content basically yeah. um, for social media. And they're all content creators. Some of them are bigger than the others in terms of numbers. Some of them like had like going in, going into the project, they had like a thousand, two thousand followers, yeah. and and the others have like millions. Yeah. And and that's a whole other story of how that makes how how the how the people are okay with that you could say yeah the dynamics the dynamics basically is just because everyone wants to build the entirety of like the house and yeah. and that's like a whole other that's a whole other account basically right and through that entirety they all basically benefit from it because they're 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 building like a brand together you know and we're we are all building a brand together right. and at the same time everyone's kind of living together yeah. and getting to have these type of conversations where like if you don't live with other creators that are like you, even though they create a different type of content, you wouldn't be able to have those constructive, like, like kind of like taking it all apart yeah. and being able to like 24 yeah. seven sit down and be like, hey, what do you think of this? Hey, what do you think of this? So imagine that for like a few weeks, few months, and, and then just also building this like name of the house. The model is really cool because it's, yeah. it's, it's, New for social media, right? Because social yeah. media is new, but it's existed in the form of incubators in the like past. Y Combinator, right? Like Y Combinator, like Y Combinator, and whatever yeah. else, or even just like you know, homegrown incubators of having a home with like seven founders working on different things yeah. and just collaborating and getting ideas off of each other. But that's why I like it because it's a bunch of young creatives in the same room, all with different audiences, all kind of going after different things, but working together. Yeah. The one challenge a lot of the times though that I've seen is ego. Yeah. Um, and especially among young talented people, there's often a lot of ego and pride. Absolutely. Does that ever get in the way with like, you know, the content creators and, and you all live together, right? And a lot of you share rooms too, right? No, so with, so with, so with, so yeah, so some, some do share rooms, but what do you call it? But as far as the ego, honestly, I'll tell you something, like with both houses, yeah. That's something that I haven't really had an issue with. Really, like, that's great. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of it has to do because the content creators that I brought out also were like creators that like were getting started in their journey, so they didn't get, they haven't seen like they, they haven't they haven't seen like that side of like the industry that kind of is to where they you, where it's basically like a lot of yes men that yeah. are like make you feel like that. Right. Where we are all very real, like like we're humans first, and then whatever else we do on social media. So when yeah. we have like an issue or anything, we have to like talk it out, and and people are willing to listen. That's like a culture and the morale that we built yeah. that it exists in both houses. Um, and honestly, it's not very easy because um, yeah. I I didn't going into these. I didn't expect that there was going to be any of that. I was just we're like I was like we're gonna create content. We're gonna yeah. see how it goes. But I forgot. From like the previous experience, 
that these are things that happen as yeah. well and and they these things affect how people create together these things affect how the energy of the house the energy of like the tension when there's tension yeah. you know you can feel it some people can work fine with the tension but Others with can. but with this groups of people yeah with how passionate they are they cannot it gets in the way and and usually when it gets to that point we we pause everything yeah we take a deep breath, we calm down, and we start talking. That's great. You know? And then towards the end, whether you agree or disagree, agree to disagree, or, or agree most of the time, like most of the time, it, it all just comes down to communication. And communication is something that I feel like even as we're getting, even throughout the last five years, we are becoming a little more numb to because we're used to texting on our phones. Yeah. We can't even, we, we're used to saying, hi, like texting someone across the room, even though you can just go and talk to them. Yeah. We're used to like, making friends off a of DM and all these yeah. things that like we're basically having to work backwards to things that people that we should have learned growing up yeah. but because we're growing up with our phones it's like we're having to deal with those things on our own in these dynamic in this type of dynamic where it's like kind of like you could say also like speed ramping right. all these social skills all these like working skills all these like also life lessons of situations that have arise when you have that many people living together who we could say have an ego, and if they do ever have an ego, yeah. someone calls it out, and it's like there's there's that we, that we build that morale already. Yeah, you hold that accountability yeah. for each other. That's exactly. Great. What about you know? So there's such a heavy reliance on social media though when you're a content creator, right? Like if these if these platforms change their algorithm or whatever else, you're kind of at their mercy. Um, do you do you build relationships with these with the social media platforms? Like, do they ever help in, in giving advice on the type of content they're looking for or whatever else? Like, uh, you know, is there any insider insight you can give us here? So personally, I've, I've been able to build some relationships with the platforms, but as the platforms have gotten bigger, yeah. it's gotten a little bit more hard because they're all, their teams are getting bigger, obviously. Right. So that type of like person to person doesn't exist as much. Like the reach outs, yeah, et cetera. And they, and they do are, and they, and they are making that effort to like, make you feel like more like informed, et cetera. Because you guys, are, I mean, yeah. you're, you're such a prominent part of their community, right? If all the influencers leave social media, it's like, uh, then it just becomes me talking to my regular friends. At which point, Absolutely. I should just hang out with them in person, anyways. Absolutely. So it's it's the it's the you know we're all consuming you all, right? Uh, yeah. the, the content you create. So I, it's it's an interesting dynamic in my mind, or an interesting um, dichotomy, I guess. Of, how do these platforms support their creators? Do you all feel yeah. supported by them or do you not? No, so we definitely feel supported by them because we've had those type of conversations where like, where like they're like, hey, like, like you should do this. Hey, we recommend you use this new feature, et cetera. Okay. But as far as like the, the more intimate like conversations, like where it's like, like mm. the, the platform like trying to like, like have like a content strategy or whatever for you. Yeah. It's, you can't really get that you could say because also, if you think of it from their perspective, like they like you can't have like the 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 time and the favorites of like when sure. you when you reach out to these creators because there's there's tens of thousands of creators, you know, that yeah. like now you just never know who's like who's gonna who's gonna talk or who isn't or also just like at least for me, like I always remind people, like especially in, in like these houses, I'm like, hey, remember, at the end of the day, you could be making the best content possible or the worst content possible. You have a lot of luck because there's a lot of people that are out there making really good content, you know, depending on who's watching. Yeah. And the algorithm is not favoring them. Mm -hmm. You are very lucky. We are very lucky because we are, at the end of the day, being controlled by the algorithm. The algorithm loves what we're, what we're doing, which is basically taking people's attention yeah. because we're posting content. That's that's a moment where the where they're watching our content and the platform can see that they're watching our content so they're going to push us more mm -hmm. if we continue to create that type of content and they're going to favor us more which is where this whole theory of like when you don't post often unless your content is really really compelling like and like you're, you don't depend on the algorithm because i feel like for the most part the creators that especially that have come from like the recent few years yeah. it's very reliant on the algorithm where like people are like What's happened to social media? Not everyone's an actor, not everyone's a singer. The thing is, it's not even about how good someone is, it's about the fact that those creators are gathering the attention of these consumers yeah. who are people like you and I, right. and at the end of the day, these apps, that's how they thrive. That's how they are able to move yeah. forward with whatever, the, whatever like that's what makes 
that's what, that's what makes them like be um, make make revenue, etc. Yeah. And and just have more power over society if you want to put it that way. It's I don't know. To me, it's like a whole other like thing where it's like I remind I make sure to remind both houses because they have no idea of this other side. I'm like yeah. I'm like. The reason why your video didn't work, even though it's so good, is because it's not the type of video you're used to posting. And because it's not the type of video you're used to posting, your audience, your audience is not going to resonate to it. And if your audience doesn't resonate to it, especially within the first 20 minutes, like it's, it's supposed to, it. it's not going to get pushed. Right. That's how it works. And, it and it's hard for them to There's a lot of people that it. think they're being shadow banned as well. A lot of people will say like, oh, the yeah. algorithm hates me. It's, I'm shadow banned. It's like, mm, I don't, your I don't audience might not person. be relating to your, to your content. It's probably yeah. what's happening. More. And there's so many variables too. Posting time. The day you post, yeah, yeah. the mood of the people on the other side. You yeah. know, people forget that at the end of the day. They, these other people, the, the what do you call it? The the people on the other side are also humans. Right. And maybe the first two thousand people that your post usually go out to, maybe that day those two thousand people are not online. Yeah. Because it's possible. It is possible. Yeah. <laughs> so what about Houston after the pandemic? I mean, has yeah. it been? It seems like it's bouncing back. But what have you been yeah. seeing there? Personally, um, Houston. Like and like from what I saw, like or did it, it never go down? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna tell you like it it, it it was affected in many ways in terms of live events and yeah. stuff like that. But in general, like in terms of like small businesses and etc., it's never really been like closed out. You know, yeah. Houston. I know Austin was, but Houston wasn't. Yeah. Um, it might have to do with the fact that like Houston's also very spread out because Houston is very spread out. Like. Like that's the only con I would tell you. Like, be, like when 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 I when I was living but more here. more so than LA. Absolutely, yeah. It's okay. very spread out. Like, like you'll be like you you'll know someone. It's like we like we're in the southwest part of the city, and then someone else is like on the on the north side of the city, and like you'll see them every day, and you're like, how is this? Like for me, I'm like, how is this normal? And people are just used to driving long distances. Yeah. And it's just so crazy because like everything is like everywhere, mm-hmm. which is like which is where I kind of like have my, my other con of like that's where there isn't like a real sense of community that's been built and it's taking a long longer than it should yeah. because everyone's everything's been like through social media word of mouth okay. because it's all the way on the other side of the city. But um, uh, after the pandemic, um, with Houston, I could say that if anything, it's boomed a lot more because there's so many people moving there, right? From all that's these places, happening. especially from like San Francisco, yeah, especially from Cali, people. absolutely. Yeah. Um, which is huge um, to the economy there as well, and it's very, it's very like telling. Also, just in, in just the people that you see out when you when you go out to a coffee shop, a trendy coffee shop, or to a really cool trendy like lunch spot, yeah. you can tell like, like at least I can because I've like I've seen like different. I've been getting I've, I've gotten the opportunity to see different parts of like how people behave in different parts of the country. Yeah. And where I'm like, wow, like this city is changing. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we're towards the end here. I, you really? know, I would love to hear like what, yeah. uh, you know, how can people best support you? Are there any new projects that you want to talk about that, uh, you know, people need to know about to support and follow? Like what, what's going on? Any new next plays? Yeah. Next plays also. Um, so I'm working on, on a, a, a film project okay. as well, which is, which is going to be very apparent on my social media when I do start working on, when I, when I do publicize it. Yeah. So I guess that's gonna be like my big push, to, right. to be honest with you, because when are we gonna hear about it? I feel like any, anytime soon. Anytime soon, I'm gonna start like just documenting the journey, yeah. because I do. That's that's this where this is a full length film. Um, it might be either a full length film or a pilot. Okay. The idea is to make it into something bigger um, after I make either or, right. um, to be able to like make it like a, a thing, you know, where it's like like pitching it to a streamer or like or like something getting bought out by a streamer, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's gonna be based also like a lot of it on these experiences that I mentioned. Um, just, it's like making like a world where like all these experiences that I've gotten into um, to have, making like a world for this and also taking place probably in my home city. You yeah. know, so, so that's another yeah. reason too, uh, like even like, like I was, I, I chose on, on like establishing there as like a company yeah. now because I saw that like even with this project, like with my pa- with my real passion, if you want to put it that way, that it was, it was going to be taking place there. I'm probably going to have to be shooting there. So I was like, hey, if I'm going to be there all this year, I might as well start there. Because that's yeah. who's to say that you can't expand anywhere else, you know? Yeah, it's a fair point. People can follow you on all Gilbert social media. Sosa, all social medias. But really, the main one, you know, Instagram, of course. Yeah. And, and then, if you don't have Instagram, anywhere else. And Teja's house. And Teja's house. Well, in my Instagram, you can find 
all, all the ads. All you know, so it'll all be right. easier. Yeah. Thank you so much again. It was such a pleasure. I'll see you thank soon. Thank you for having me, man. Thanks for coming to LA. Oh, yeah. yeah. Th th <laughs> thank you for having me, giving me a reason to come to LA, you know? Love it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers, man. Woo!